All too often when we talk about marketing, we are talking about advertising. And while advertising is part of marketing, it's actually only a, a sliver of the stuff that needs to be considered. And one of the things you can do right now that's within your control and more or less doesn't cost you any money is making sure that your customers are having a good experience with your business. To talk about that today, we'll go to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where Ryan Chute is going to remind us that if your salespeople are being measured by the sales and the dollars they bring in, that may actually be working against your company. Tom Wainick is in the Cleveland area, and he's going to talk about three things that you measure right now to make sure that your employees are treating your customers right, and when you do that, sales will come in. Let's start in Canada, though, with Ryan Chute, and businesses are coming back online. Customers are coming back into stores. So what are businesses doing right now? I think that a lot of folks are, are trying to make sure that they're within compliance to, to what their state or, or provincial laws are dictating uh, as far as reopening and things like that go, that they're trying to do what's right. And, and ultimately that's, that's valid and important, but it's also important to make sure that we're doing what's right for our employees when, when it comes to time off and being flexible. Um, and that, that those intentions will pass along through to the, to the customer there's there's going to be all kinds of things like plexiglass uh, barriers and limited office interaction spacing issues that you have to deal with but really what it comes down to is um, being a company that's that's compassionate that's that's helping their employees as much as their customers um, achieve success and results whatever those those positive things are being trustworthy and and frankly being grateful Tom, you have said in the past that customer experience isn't just you know an idea and, and we should treat our customers right, but really it's more of a discipline and something you've got to deliberately do. Expand on that. Tell me, tell me a little more about what you mean by that. Yeah, it's one of my biggest pet peeves is uh, you know thinking that you could shoot from the hip pocket and just have a great customer experience, right? Uh, that you could just print out these "I love my customer" uh, mugs and T-shirts and you know say let's just delight the customer and it just doesn't work like that because well, what delights you and what delights Ryan is vastly different than what might delight me as a customer, and so we have to take that into account. I, I had a uh, I have a client that is a, a jeweler and uh, they, they preached, you know, to all the sales staff, you know, delete, delight the customer, delight the customer. And so, you know, that was left to the individual's interpretation yeah. and it created a sales disaster uh, where sales declined because what the business owner found is we had these long lines of customers waiting because we were taking an abundant amount of time uh, serving beverages and food and chatting up the customer when all they really wanted was to get in and out of the store. And so they were losing sales because of delighting the customer. And they didn't define that for the sales staff. See, and these two, th what, what you're, you're both saying tie in together so nicely with each other because as people are sort of tiptoeing around the corner and saying, is it safe to come back in now? Um, you've got to be very deliberate in how you tell them that it's safe to come back in now. And, and I, I think we've, I, I know we're past the hump of freaking everybody out and saying, my God, isn't it scary out there? Um, so what are some of the shoulds and shouldn'ts, Ryan, um, as far as, you know, because how do I word this? I, I was struck by the Domino's commercial that is now promising that they don't touch your pizza after it comes out of the oven. But after leaving our 450 degree ovens, the only hands that touch them are yours. That's one of those things like, well, what the hell were you doing before, right? Um, and, and so how, so where's that little bridge between um, welcoming them back in uh, and, and not freaking them out? I think it's quite reasonable at this point in time to, to take the time to do a touch point assessment and really just look at every spot where you're touching the customer from the, from the CSR, uh, taking that phone call into book an appointment through to uh, people being received uh, through a retail door at, uh, uh, as traffic. Um, in Canada, for example, they have to actually log everyone that's coming in and going out so that there's X amount of people that are in the store at any given time. Um, some, some stores have mask policies. Uh, some stores are, 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 asking for um, compliance when it comes to six foot distancing. Some, some aren't, right? Um, 
ultimately those are those are the kind of the key elements of what we're dealing with here today as we're going into it. But all of those things translate into, as we say, the everyday, you know, and, and good principle is good principle. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, if we look at the touch points and we see where can we uh, make it easier, smoother, faster, uh, more comfortable for the customer to uh, get to the point of purchase, we're winning, right? Time, time is a test, in my opinion, and ultimately the customer is gauging us on whether we're being successful or not with the, the um, commitment that they've given us with their time. Um, people are busy, and ultimately, if we don't have a product that's any different than anything else, that's we are the difference. The only reason they're going to buy from us is us. If you go into a car dealership, you can buy that car at every single dealership, right? So what makes you different? How we treat the people that, that, uh, that we receive. And our actions are going to speak much louder than, than our words. We can say all day long, post all kinds of great videos and all kinds of wonderful things that kind of demonstrate our worth, but it's, it's the proof is in the pudding, right? Let's, let's get out there and do the things that are right. Um, both socially uh, responsible for what we're dealing with now with with uh, uh, pandemic issues, but just in general principles. Tom, Tom and I had a nice conversation um, a number of months back regarding the, the, the idea of not every touch point is an um, infinite um, mm -hmm. delight factor. And just as he says with his, with his, uh, uh, jewelry customer everything isn't about being delightful it's about being exactly what the customer wants and that certainly lives in the in the mind of the customer but remembering that by the time we're done with the customer we need to find something that is going to surprise and delight them is is the is the linchpin is is the difference between a, a good review and a great review a sincere review a loyal customer and all the things that matter to the company in the first place, which is to stand head and shoulders above their competition. So they get repeat business. Tom, you're nodding your head. Chime in there. Uh, I, you know, some, something Ryan said that was, was really profound. And he said that the, the right principles are, are the right principles. Good principles are, are good principles, whether you're in a situation like we're in now, or just, you know, we talk about normal times. I, uh, you, you know, go back to the basics. One of the things that you should be doing no matter what is actively listening to your customers. Uh, you know, getting on the phones, listening to what uh, they're saying, the questions that they're asking, uh, boots on the ground, get in the showroom, uh, dr uh, ride alongs with your tech technicians, uh, whatever it takes to, to listen to the customers and, and get their direct feedback. Oh man, that alone could lead to such profound insights as to what to do uh, to, to improve your products and services. Such a basic thing. And yeah, and I think we're going to be surprised if we're not already picking up on it of how much isn't going to change. I mean, some of those, you know, you say you use the word basics, but it's uh, yeah, it's stuff that you probably should have been doing anyway. And now you have the opportunity to really up your game. That's right. I mean, these are fundamentals for a reason, right? Uh, yeah. You know, I, just what Ryan said, go back to the basics, do the fundamentals, do the, the good principles that you should have been doing anyways. Uh, and, and, and you'll be light years ahead of the competition. I mean, you, you know, that's how you get through things like this. You, you don't go look for looking for a red herring or, you know, that, that special little shiny object that's going to take you to the promised land. It's, it's mm -hmm. about the fundamentals. To, to that end, and Ryan, you can speak to this, um, what should businesses be measuring? We love throwing around the acronym KPIs and everybody has a different definition of what that means or what that should mean. Ultimately, what, what does a business measure to see, is this thing working? Am I connecting with my customers? That's something that we've been talking a lot about with a couple of clients recently. And, you know, it's, it, there's a couple of things that come out of that. One is KPIs. It stands for Key Performance Indicators. And the other is Metrics That Matter, um, a book that was written a uh, number of years ago, but uh, still very relevant today. I'm trying to remember who the author is, but it's, it's evading me. Uh, two things that boil down to, one, a key performance indicator is an indicator, not a whipping stone, right? So it's not one of those things where we're, okay, haha, we've caught you, you're under power, it's time to ax you and, and take you to the guillotine. Um, and the metrics that matter are metrics that revolve around actions and behaviors, right? 
So we get really obsessed with results, right? In, in most businesses, because um, usually somebody above us in the automotive world, the OEM is obsessed about the result. Um, if it's in furniture, it's going to be the manufacturers. If it's a franchisee, it's going to obviously be the franchise offices, all of these things where we're just fixated on the result. So we're just trying to get to the result come hell or high water. When in reality, good leadership, not management you know, of the task, but leadership of the people comes down to, are you doing the behaviors and actions necessary to achieve the result that you want? And by the time we're finished that, result is a historical uh, uh, number. Did we achieve it above the bar or below the bar? Steve Ray, one of our partners, when he went into the radio station and started doing things the Wizard of Ad ways, one of the first things that he did was he eliminated sales quotas 100% because he found that it, it uh, changed the disposition of the people who are on commission typically to do whatever it took to get the sale done, not do what was right to make sure the customer won. So there's a big difference between the two. If we just stuck to our, our, our behaviors and actions, we would see that we could maneuver off of that. We can also manage that better. and We can also train off of that better when we stick to those consistent things that actually help us get you know, over the finish line. Um, and in some cases, a sales quota is just as bad as, as anything else. Um, in, in productivity. Daniel Pink writes about it in his book, Drive. Um, there's a video online that speaks about uh, um, the counterintuitive um, strengths of, of what we see as uh, um, incentive. But, it, 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 you know, I've seen plenty of salespeople, they hit their target and they go on full stop and, and check yeah. out for the rest of the month. So are we really gaining or, 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 or are we really kind of holding ourselves back? And that point right there, I think, is hugely important, this idea that the number is the result of the effort that you put in. And it's true with anything. I mean, it's, you know, you, you want to lose weight, you, you focus on eating right and, and walking on a block a couple of times. But we, we know that this is true, and yet we still don't do it. Why? Uh, that, that's a great question. I mean, the first thing I think about that, that really what Ryan was saying was making sure that we're measuring the right things and trying to achieve the, the, the result that we want to achieve, you know. So within that, there's this alignment issue. And Johnny, you know, a lot of times we get on, on the phone with clients and, you know, they talk about being customer centric. Yet at the end of the day, when you ask them, well, in your team meetings, what are you measuring that points to uh, customer centricity? And there's you know, crickets, where we don't measure anything. Well, you can't improve what you do not measure. Uh, there's, there's nothing in there tying in customer centricity. Well, what are you going to expect, right? And everything is based on sales, uh, like Ryan was saying, you know, sale, sale, sale. And, uh, you know, you just got to sit down and, and really look at, you know, what type of company are we? Are we customer centric? We sales centric, operationally efficient? What are we trying to achieve? What do we, what do we need to me measure? And the other thing that, uh, you know, when, as Ryan was talking to made me think is a lot of times uh, we too like to uh, just measure things and we like to collect data, but we don't take action with the data. We just collect it. So, you know, if you're going to collect data and, and you're going to measure things, be sure that you're going to take action with, with that feedback that you get. How does a business then measure the things that maybe – don't go on a spreadsheet that the, the, the squishier things of doing right by the customer. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a number of, of ways to go about it. The first thing that pops up is the ubiquitous uh, NPS or net promoter score, right? Which is, which is an indicator of advocacy. It's a Likert scale from zero to 10. And, and it's a basic single question you ask a customer, uh, you know, how likely are you to refer this brand to a, a uh, friend or a colleague, and zero, not likely at all, 10, very likely. And then uh, there's, a, there's a formula that NPS uses to separate the, uh, the uh, detractors from the passives and those who are the advocates and promoters uh, of that brand. Uh, so that's, that's probably the most common way, but there are others. I mean, there's a suite of different customer experience metrics that uh, an organization can use to really gauge how effective uh, they are at, uh, at, at their experience that they provide. 
for me, it's, it's, it's on the front line. <clears throat> I'm speaking to my managers and I'm, I'm telling them to, to put down the paperwork, to stand up, go walk around the showroom, to listen to people, to actually hear what they're saying, to get that feedback and be engaged in, in the sales process so that you have a clear understanding of what, where things went sideways, right? Uh, HVAC guys, I'm talking to them right now and they're, they're no question that they never talk to us, a, a guy during a sale. Now I have them talking to the guy as he's building the deal. I have him talking to the guy. Um, if he runs into a, a no chance of, of closing the deal today, I have him talking to the customer before he's um, uh, basically wrapping up the call. They're seeing an increase of, of closing uh, upwards of 30% because they're engaged in the sales process now instead of just standing back and hoping that their guys are going to do exactly what they need them to do. You support that with some really simple word tracks that you can trust that they're going to go out there and do the right thing. Um, and I say word tracks, not unlike our brandable chunks, um, th th those elements, those belief statements, those stances that we have that really do drive home a consistent um, a delivery of what it is we do. So uh, you're, you're going to get great results out of your staff if you teach them in a way that's simple enough for them to understand it in a frequency that's high enough for them to remember and uh, to make sure that they're, they're going out there and doing the right thing every single day and, and starting from the place of intent. Sales, sales is very much about intention. So is, so is it as simple as saying, you know, these are the things that we believe to be true and these are the things that if we treat our customers this way, sales will surely follow. So now we're measuring, did you treat the customer this way? Is, is, that, is that the way you put that together? That's a big part of your, that's a big part of your system. Now there's some technical elements to a sales system as well that follow along certain lines of, of, um, of psychology and neuroscience. But really what it boils down to is we have to program our staff to be consistent with what we believe in. And we have to demonstrate to our staff by our actions as leaders that this is actually how we believe it and this is actually how we live it. That means that you have to treat your staff the way you want your customers treated mm. in a way that they're going to win. And you want to treat them with trust and integrity and, and dignity um, equally as much with gratitude. And this isn't a guessing game. I think, Tom, the, the trick is you got to talk to the customers and work from their perception inward. Uh, but talk a little bit more about that from being, because you yeah, mentioned, you mentioned right. customer centricity and sales centricity and operationally efficient. Uh, go, go a little bit deeper on, on customer centricity. Yeah, I mean, and it dovetails nicely into what Ryan is saying. I mean, there's, there's two things that I could draw from and, and comment uh, on that, that Ryan said beautifully. And the first thing is taking an outside-in perspective which is that uh, we're gonna go and view our organization, our product category from the outside in, from the customer's perspective inward. Uh, most companies don't do that. Of course, they take an inside out perspective. They, they focus on building products and services and, and say, okay, now who could we sell this to? Mm -hmm. And so one of the most efficient things in, in, that you can do as an organization is get your staff, again, doing what Ryan uh, talked about, listening to the customer, hearing what they have to say. Uh, you're going to notice when you do that too, that you know, you'll get three or four themes that, that, that develop. Uh, maybe they're things that you can improve or uh, issues that you need to handle and take care of uh, to fix your experience. But uh, it, again, I am, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but it's such an easy thing to do is get on the front lines or talk to those frontline employees, get on the phones yourself, like I said, and get that outside in perspective. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the best books that I read about this uh, was from Young Me Moon. And uh, I think the book was called Different. And she talked about that a business organization and those working within the organization are the connoisseurs of that business. And when they survey the horizon, they see all the subtle little nuances, uh, the asymmetries of that product category, where the customer is not the connoisseur. They are the novice. And when they survey the horizon, they see shades of gray because they suffer, suffer from apathy. They just don't care like we do. And so that's why it's really uh, a necessity to take that outside in perspective and, and, and learn 
what the customer is really thinking and feeling when it comes to your products and services. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that uh, that Ryan said I think is is uh, enlightening is is this idea that treat your employees well and they will treat your customers well. I mean, that's something we call the law of congruent experience, right? And it's the, the thing that you could do today to best improve your customer experience is just take care of your customers. Uh, Bruce Timken is, is perhaps the godfather of experience. He said, uh, my favorite quote, um, employees will do what is measured, incented, and celebrated. Employees will do what is measured, incented, and celebrated. And if we could just do that and improve our employee engagement as a byproduct, we will imp improve our customer experience. One last question. Um, would I be more credible if I was wearing a black shirt right now? 100%. Yes. 100%. I knew I goofed this up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It happens, man. It's always next time, rookie. <laughs> These are conversations that we're having with our clients and conversations that we're having with each other. The stuff normally you'd only hear if you were sitting around the Wizards Roundtable. We appreciate you watching, and if you want to get in touch with me or any of the folks on the show today, here are their emails.